Hello, family. I'm Jill Morricone. We welcome you to a brand new quarter of the 3ABN Sabbath School panel. If you've been following with us last week, we finished the Gospel of Mark and we move this week to the Gospel of John. I love John's Gospel. I believe it's my favorite Gospel. Themes in the Gospel of John. If you want the notes from the panelists week by week, we encourage you to go to 3ABN Sabbath School panel.com. On that website at the top is a little tab that says notes. All you have to do is click on that, fill out the information, and we will sign you up. If you already receive our notes, then you don't have to sign up because you'll be signed up in perpetuity. want to introduce our family right now on the set. To my left, Brother Ryan Day, glad you're here. Amen. Always a blessing to be a part of 3 and Sabbath School panel. I have Monday's lesson entitled, The Second Sign in Galilee. Good point. I should have told you what the lesson was about, shouldn't I have? Signs <laughs> that point the way. And then Ryan has the second sign in Galilee. Uh, to Ryan's left is Professor Daniel Perrin. Thank you. It's good to be here. And I have Tuesday's lesson, The Miracle at the Pool of Bethesda. Amen. To Daniel's left is my sister in Christ, Shelley Quinn. Well, I'm very happy that I have Wednesday hard hearts. Ooh, that's a good study. Last but not least, Pastor James Rafferty. Good to be here, Jill. I have Thursday's lesson, which is entitled, Jesus Claims. Ooh, amen. Before we go any further, we want to go to the Lord in prayer before we open up the book of John. Uh, Ryan, would you pray for us? Sure. Father in heaven, Lord, as we launch ourselves into this exciting study in the book of John, I pray, Lord, that you will bless us that you will give us wisdom and knowledge and understanding of how to rightly divide mm. your word of truth, that each and every one of us will be drawn closer to Jesus Christ. And uh, that you bless our viewers, Lord, that they'll mm -hmm. be able to study with us, get those notes, and that we all grow and learn together. We ask this in Jesus' holy name. Amen. 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 The author of this quarterly, The Adult Bible Study Guide, actually has two authors, Dr. Tom Shepard, who authored the book of Mark, uh, the quarterly on Mark when we studied it last quarter, as well as E. Edward Zink. He's the former associate director for the Biblical Research Institute of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, or the BRI. Excited about this gospel, John's gospel. We're going to set the stage a little bit before we jump into Sunday's lesson and my lesson. If you look at the gospel of John, it's really separate, is it not, from the other three synoptic Gospels? Matthew, Mark, and Luke, synoptic just means see together, and they kind of overlay or overlap with the parables and the miracles and the stories. John is a little separate. We see some differences. Parables are common in the synoptic Gospels. They're almost non-existent in John's Gospel. We find the portrayal of Jesus in John's Gospel is not so meek and mild. He's a little more assertive in John's Gospel. In the Synoptic Gospels, Jesus is focused primarily on his Galilean ministry, and that's what they focus on. In John's Gospel, he's in Jerusalem almost all the time. It's interesting as well, the biographical material that you find in the other Gospels. John's Gospel has 40% less than the Gospel of Mark, 50% less than Matthew, and 60% less than the Gospel of Luke. Why is that? Because John's not so concerned with the story, but for the significance, for the life and faith of the church. There's a focus in John's Gospels on one-on-one -on -one personal interviews. Mm -hmm. We see that in John chapter 1 with Jesus and Nathanael, Jesus and Nicodemus in John 3, Jesus and the woman at the well, John 4, Jesus and the paralytic at the pool of Bethesda, John 5, Jesus and the woman caught in adultery, John 8, Jesus and the man who was born blind, John 9, Jesus and Lazarus, John 11, Jesus and Pilate, John 18, Jesus and Thomas when he wanted to put his finger into his side, that's John 20, Jesus and Peter or the restoration of Peter. Peter, the breakfast by the sea. That's John 21. Mark's gospel is about action. Matthew might you consider about parable. Luke is about caring for others, especially the um, outcast in society. But John's gospel is all about theology. In fact, it is said that John presents the divinity of Christ more clearly and more consistently than any other apostolic writing. 
It's also said that no other gospel or New Testament writing has individually contributed more to the Christian understanding of the nature of the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit's work than the Gospel of John. In John, we see this belief motif and believing in Jesus, accepting Jesus as Messiah. John, of course, is written by none other than one of the sons of thunder, James and John, the sons of Zebedee. And he refers to himself in the gospel as the disciple who Jesus loved. I like that. John is the last gospel they believe written not just the last gospel, the last book written in the New Testament, actually even written after Revelation. He was exiled on Patmos. He came back from Patmos and wrote the Gospel of John. This week, we look at signs that point the way. And I want to ask you a question. Why did John write his gospel? The answer is found in actually our memory text, so let's read that. Our memory text is in John 20, almost at the end of the book, John puts his thesis or objective for why he wrote the Gospel of John. We're in John 20, verses 30 and 31. And truly, Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. Why did he write his gospel? That you and I may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that we would have eternal life in his name. John being the last book written in the New Testament is really written for the second generation of believers because all the disciples and apostles, those people who walked and talked with Jesus, except for John, they're all dead now. And there's nobody on the scene in the new Christian church who has experienced and walked and talked with Jesus. And this gospel, John, bridges that gap to that new generation, the second generation of believers. I love that John likes the number seven. There's seven I am statements in the gospel of John seven theological discourses, but seven signs. And we're starting that this week. And then next week, we're going to finish those signs. The first sign is the wedding at Cana. Now, these signs are miracles showing that Jesus Christ is divine. Sign number one is the wedding at Cana. I'm going to study that on Sunday's lesson. Sign two, Ryan has the healing of the nobleman's son. Sign three, Daniel has the paralytic at the pool of Bethesda. And then next week, we cover the rest of those seven signs. Feeding of the 5,000, walking on water, the man who was born blind in John chapter 9, and then the raising of Lazarus to life. So let's look at Sunday's lesson. The wedding at Cana. What sign did Jesus do at Cana? Clearly, it was the water turned into wine, but let's unpack that. We're in John chapter 2. Turn with me to John chapter 2. We're going to pick it up in verse 1. We got five takeaways, Ryan. Hopefully, we'll get to them all. all right. On the third day, there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee. So, wait a minute, a third day, what does this mean? Now, if you study, we're probably about 50 days after the baptism of Jesus. You can study the baptism of Jesus in John chapter 1. We're probably 50 days after that. But John says on the third day, this would be the third day after Jesus called Philip and Nathaniel. So you see the calling of Philip and Nathaniel to be disciples, to follow Jesus. And then on the third day, there's this wedding in Cana. Now, incidentally, uh, Nathaniel lived in Cana, which was a neighboring town to Nazareth. And the mother of Jesus was there. Takeaway number one, God places people at the right time in the right place. It's not an accident that Jesus' mama is here at this wedding. John is deliberate in referencing it. You see, we don't always understand what God's doing, but he knows what he's doing. And he places people at the right time in the right place. Verse 2, now both Jesus and his disciples were invited to the wedding. Takeaway number two, God's plans are always bigger than ours. You see, when they invited Jesus and the disciples, they thought they'd just come as guests and they had no idea of the miracle that was going to take place. Verse 3 says, And when they ran out of wine, the mother of Jesus said to him, They have no wine. Now, we won't get into here whether it's fermented or unfermented. We believe it's unfermented. You can contact 3ABN. We can give me, you more details on that at a different time. But takeaway number three, 
Faith makes the need known. Mm -hmm. What did Jesus do? She went and said, they have no wine, thinking, what's he supposed to do about it? I don't know, but she had faith that he could do something. Let's read verse four and five. Jesus said to her, woman, what does your concern have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. Now let's pause a moment. If you were to say to me, woman, I would take a little of offense to that, but especially depending on the tone of voice. But this word for woman in their culture and in the Greek was not an offensive term like we might take it in today's culture. It was actually a respectful term. Having said that, there's still a polite reprimand that Jesus gives here, saying, my hour is not yet come. But what does his mother do? Verse five, his mother said to the servants, whatever he says to you, do it. Mm -hmm. Take away number four, faith continues against all odds. She could have taken that polite reprimand and just kind of sat in the corner and said, okay, I'm gonna be quiet. But her faith persisted. Her faith continued against all odds. And what happened? Jesus told them, fill six water pots with water, bring it out to the master of the feast. When they put the dipper in, what came out? Water? No, water didn't come out. The unfermented juice came out. A miracle happened. The water was turned to wine. And in fact, the master of the feast said, they saved the best for last. Mm -hmm. Now let's talk a little history here. Moses, the prophet who delivered Israel, freed Israel from Egyptian bondage, did he not? Mm -hmm. And he became their savior. How did he free them? Deuteronomy 6.22 says he freed them, brought them out by many signs and wonders. What was one of those signs? The turning of the water to blood. Mm -hmm. Now Jesus, the Messiah, who came to deliver Israel, came to free us from the bondage of sin. He became our savior. And what is his first sign? What is his first miracle? Turning water into wine. In the Old Testament and Jewish traditions, the coming of the Messiah was associated with the outpouring of wine. If you read Amos chapter nine, we see the raising up of David's line and the Messiah coming through David's line. And what does it say? The mountains will drip with sweet wine and all the hills will flow with it. If you read Genesis 49, Jacob's blessing of his sons, his blessing to Judah through whom would come the Messiah. He washed his garments in wine and his clothes in the blood of grapes. I think it's significant that Jesus' first sign, first miracle as Messiah, points back to the deliverance of the children of Israel from Egypt, but points forward to Jesus as his people's deliverer, as the Messiah, and it's connected with wine. Verse 11, this beginning of signs, the first sign Jesus did in Cana of Galilee and manifested his glory and the disciples believed in him. Take away five, God gives us evidence on which to rest our faith. Right. Mm, amen. Thank you so much, Jill. Great uh, foundation there. I'm going to be beginning with, I'm actually going to be opening up Monday's lesson, which is the, sign, the second sign in Galilee. My name is Ryan Day, and uh, we're going to be jumping over to John chapter 4, and we're going to start by reading verses 46 to 54. And uh, we're going to read through the story, and then we're going to make some comments. I think there's some powerful lessons that we can learn here uh, from this particular lesson. So I'm going to jump into John chapter 4. We're going to start reading in verse 46. It says, so Jesus came again to Cana of Galilee, where he had made the water wine. And there was a certain nobleman whose son was sick at Capernaum. When he heard that Jesus had come out of Judea into Galilee, he went to him and implored him to come down and heal his son, for he was at the point of death. Then Jesus said to him, unless you people see signs and wonders, you will by no means believe. The nobleman said to him, Sir, come down before my child dies. Jesus said to him, Go your way, your son lives. So the man believed the word that Jesus spoke to him, and he and when he excuse me, and he went his way and went his way. And as he was now going down, his servant met him and told him, saying, Your son lives. Verse 52. Then he inquired of them the hour when he got better. And they said to him, yesterday at the seventh hour, the fever left him. So the father knew that it was at that same hour in which Jesus said to him, your son lives. 
and he himself believed in his whole household. This again is the second sign Jesus did when he had come out of Judea into Galilee. And so here Jesus is giving this second account now, or, or John is giving the second account of Jesus uh, performing a second sign, a miracle, I guess you could call it. And uh, this is kind of John's way of, of adding here that this is, again, uh, that, uh, an opportunity for people to be able to see and believe in Christ. Because in this case, this is what this man required. Now, uh, you can see kind of a little bit of, a, um, I guess, a reprimand or a, a rebuke here from Jesus to this man. Not that Jesus was being harsh, but uh, this is what this man had to see in order to believe in Christ. There's a lot of people like this, right? Uh, seeing is believing. We've heard that, uh, that particular saying many times. If I could just see uh, this particular miracle done, if I could just see this with my own eyes, then I would believe. And so uh, the lesson actually uses the language here. It says, at first, Jesus' response to the nobleman's plea may seem a little harsh. Uh, yet this official had made the healing of his son the criterion for believing in Jesus. Jesus read his heart and pinpointed the spiritual sickness that was more profound than his son's life-threatening illness. I just like the way he worded that, that Jesus could look into this man's heart and see that while this man was coming for the purpose of uh, healing his dying son, uh, Jesus saw a, an even greater sickness, which is this man doesn't even really believe, fully believe in me, though he's coming on a whim. I wonder if I can bring my case to Jesus and Jesus can heal my son. Of course, this man obviously recognizes that I, I need to believe in this man in order for my son to live. And so he eventually complies. But Jesus, again, speaks those words. I, I think the, the overall point that the lesson brings out that I really want to bring home is, and it says this right here, it says miracles. Miracles reveal only the existence of the supernatural. They do not by themselves mean that God must be the one doing them. And it brings out the fact that Satan also performs miracles. And if by miracles, we mean supernatural acts, Satan can do that. Mm -hmm. And so I think that uh, beautifully how the lesson was brought out here or really highlighted the point that um, while yes, Jesus had to come on the scene and he had to perform some of these miracles and signs in order for some to believe, that should not be the foundation in which we anchor our believing. In other words, uh, I don't want to just believe in Christ because I have seen mighty works or I've seen miracles. Uh, that is not the foundational reason for why we should believe, which is why Jesus says to him that you people seek after signs and miracles. This is kind of somewhat Jesus rebuking and saying, man, would you believe in my word? Would you still have faith in me and who I am, even if you did not see the signs. It also brings me back to John chapter 20. Even Thomas, the disciple, had this very issue. And Jesus kind of rebukes him and says, you believe because you have seen. Blessed are those, a time is coming in the near future. He says, blessed are those who will believe in me who have not seen me. And so I believe that that also applies to us today. Back to this idea that not every miracle is from God. And in my, in my travels, and I know you guys have probably run into this too, there's a lot of people today that still anchor their belief in seeing signs and miracles. That if they don't see the signs, they don't see the miracles, if they don't see the supernatural at work, well, then God must not be in it. Mm -hmm. And I just want to remind you here, the Bible gives us many, many accounts, even Jesus himself, many accounts that in the last days, the devils, the demons would work powerful miracles. For instance, Matthew 24, verse 24, it says, false Christ mm -hmm. and false prophets will arise and show great signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. I'm also bringing into this 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 1, which says, Now the Spirit expressly says that in latter times, that's talking about our time, uh, some will depart from the faith, giving heed to deceiving spirits and, of course, doctrines of demons. And we know that these deceiving spirits are not just deceiving by word and, and by thoughts and ideas, but also by signs and miracles. For when you get to Revelation 16, uh, in the context of that uh, sixth plague there, in Revelation chapter 16, notice what it says. And I saw three unclean spirits like frogs coming out of the mouth of the dragon, out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet. For they are spirits of demons performing signs which go out to the kings of the earth and the whole world to gather them to battle to that great day of God Almighty. And also tie into that 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 9, where again Paul confirms that the coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan with all notice 
power, signs, and lying wonders. So if seeing is believing, and that's the only thing that we have to anchor ourselves in uh, in order to believe in God, you very well may find yourself in a situation one day where there is a supernatural sign act or what you might call a miracle that occurs right before your very eyes. And it very well may not be from God. You may be believing in a power, believing in an entity, believing in an individual that is not from God at all, which is why John, the one who wrote this very gospel, says in his first epistle, chapter 4, verse 1, 1 John chapter 4, verse 1, he says, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits whether they are of God because many false prophets have gone out into the world. And so with the remaining time I have for Monday's lesson, we want to ask ourselves the question that yes, miracles, signs, God still works them, right? And, 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 uh, and they're powerful when we see these things happen. But of course, as we've made it abundantly clear, these are not the only things that which, in which we anchor our believing in God. Um, we also have to ask the question, what are other criterion or what are other elements that, that a person must display in order to know that it is from God? In other words, uh, what are other characteristics that must be on display for us to confirm that this is definitely from God, that I can anchor my belief in this or this person or this particular act because uh, it is definitely from God and not from the enemy. Uh, Matthew chapter 12 and verse 33 to 35, Jesus provides some very clear principles here that I think we need to understand and follow. Matthew chapter 12 verse 33 to 35 says, either make the tree good and its fruit good or else make the tree bad and its fruit bad. For a tree is known by its fruit, right? How do you know that's an apple tree? Well, there should be some apples hanging on it eventually, right? Verse 34 of Matthew 12 says, brood of vipers, how can you, this is Jesus speaking, how can you being evil uh, sp uh, speak good things? For out of the abundance of your heart, the mouth speaks. Verse 35, a good man out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth good things. And an evil man out of the evil treasure brings forth evil things. And of course, Matthew chapter 7 and verse 20, same concept there. Jesus says, therefore, by their fruits, you shall know them. This is talking about the character of a being. We don't judge whether something is of God because some supernatural sign or miracle just occurred. We also judge a person by their character. Do they reflect that of a, of, of a Christ-like character? Does this person show the fruits of a person and who is actually genuinely following Christ or not. And this is essentially what Christ is making uh, a, a very clear in these particular passages. Also Galatians chapter 5 verses 22 to 24. I'm only bringing this up because someone may be watching for the first time that says, well, what do those fruits really look like? What should I look for in an individual or, or an institution or, or someone who's speaking? Or well, what am I looking for that's supposed to bear fruit of that which is from Christ? Galatians chapter 2, or excuse me, chapter 5 verses 22 to 24. It says, but the fruit of the Spirit, the Holy Spirit that is, is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. And those who are of Christ, I, lo I love this, this is verse 24, and those who are Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. When you are led by the Spirit, then you will bring forth the fruits of the Spirit. If you are led by the flesh, you know what? There may be a powerful supernatural spirit behind something or someone who's performing signs and miracles, but do they reflect the character that is the loving character of Jesus Christ? Amen. Thank you so much, Ryan. The importance of testing those signs. I love that. Don't go anywhere. We're going to go to a 3ABN mission story and we'll be right back. Hello, I'm Greg Morconi. So glad you joined me today for 3ABN Mission Moment. Kay was raised in Sri Lanka and in 1997, a Christian friend invited Kay to church. As the pastor prayed for her, she felt as if she were covered with a soft red shawl from head to toe. And in that moment, she knew all her sins were washed away and she's been following Jesus ever since. For years, Kay lived a good Christian life, attended church every Sunday, read her Bible and prayed. But one day she discovered something about the Sabbath. She was reading Hebrews chapter four and wondered what this Sabbath was all about. She went to YouTube and typed in Sabbath and guess what happened? Suddenly she found video after video of 3ABN Sabbath School panel, along with other videos too. She clicked on one and then another and another. As Kay watched, the message became clear. The seventh day is the Sabbath. Then Kay felt God speaking to her heart saying, you are on the right path. Follow me and I will direct you. 
Kay found a Seventh-day Adventist church family that welcomed her with open arms. And as the pastor spoke to her about the Sabbath, she realized she already knew much of what he told her from watching 3ABN. Kay is living proof that YouTube evangelism truly works. Thank you for your prayers and support of this ministry, God's ministry, 3ABN. Thank you for joining me for today's 3ABN Mission Moment. God bless you. Welcome back to our study on signs that point the way, and we turn it over to Daniel Perry. Thank you, Jill. I have Tuesday's lesson, The Miracle at the Pool of Bethesda. My name is Daniel Perrin. And we're going to find this miracle in John chapter 5. Now, the setting of this story is that this is Jesus' second visit to Jerusalem. It's still the first half of his ministry, but this is going to be his first sign or his first miracle that's performed in Judea and performed right there in Jerusalem among those who become his greatest enemies, the Jewish leaders. And so in John chapter 5, Jesus is walking in the city and uh, he encounters sick people everywhere he looks. At least in this particular place of Jerusalem, that's all there was. It's like a waiting room full of people who have no hope. This is their last ditch effort. And so remember, this is the creator who fashioned Adam and Eve, fashioned humanity to be in his image, to be perfect in full vigor of strength and intelligence and, and physically, mentally, spiritually, everything perfect. And, and they were designed that way to be a demonstration of God's character. And what does he see instead? He sees people broken and thrashed and wasting away and falling apart. All the sick are gathered there waiting for something, waiting for the stirring of the water, it says. Now, there was no biblical instruction to do this, no divine approval. For, for many people, this is their last attempt. They have thwarted everything else. Nothing else has worked. And so they're barely clinging to hope, and they've gathered around this pool. What is it? It's a pool of, of human legend and, and spiritual misinformation. Now, now Satan loves this, uh, loves this setup here because few people are going to receive any benefit from this. Who's going to be, receive benefit? Only the strongest, only the most selfish. And that's what he really likes because those are the ones who have the strength enough to run to the pool. And they can feel this burst of energy which makes them feel like they've been healed as they plunge in there first because the idea is that whenever the water is stirred, angels or some miraculous power will give strength and healing power to people. And so who's left behind is the neediest people who receive no benefit. They're trampled and they're disappointed and yet crowds gather here and shelters are built for them. And this is the situation that we find the world in today. Isn't that the way it is? But who can get the, the interventions? That's well, the ones who can afford it. It's the ones who have a social network of people who can start funding campaigns for them. It's the ones with connections and everybody else gets left out. And so as Ellen White writes about this in Desire of Ages, she says that there were people who literally died on the precipice of this pool, mm. waiting and wasting away. And along comes Jesus with his mind focused on meditation and prayer. And a case of extreme wretchedness catches his eye. Here's a man who, verse 7, uh, says, as he says, I have no man to help me, to help put me into the pool. Here's someone who has no friends. Nobody's with him. He's completely helpless. He could not put himself in. He's got nothing left. He's resigned to die. He's abandoned to die. And in all likelihood, that's going to happen very soon. And out of the mass of six, sick people, Jesus chooses one. Mm -hmm. One person here. And he sees in this man the seeds of faith. And we can see that as Jesus speaks to him and he says, do you want to be made well? Because Jesus is a medical missionary. Mm -hmm. That's what he is. He meets people at their need. Yeah. He meets their need and he gives them more and he helps restore them. He, most of his time was spent not preaching, but in healing people. Now he's not like a physician looking at a chart, uh, gonna pop in and then pop out after giving you a prognosis. No, imagine this cripple who sees Jesus' face. And perhaps for years, no other face had looked him in the eye with caringness and compassion. Day out, day in, day out, he's been suffering. And here comes somebody who talks to him. Do you want to see the face of Jesus mm. when you're sick, 
when you're suffering. I know I do, and I have, but that's a story for another time. But this man's situation is where we find people today that they need help, real help, and they need to see the face of Jesus. They don't need a pill that masks the symptoms. They don't need some stopgap measure to hold things off just a little while longer. They need the real change of life, and that's what Jesus offers then, and that's what he offers now. But this man has got to exercise faith. And so we get to verse 8 where Jesus uh, just directly and simply, faith-inspiringly, he says, rise, take up your bed, walk. And with all these stories, I would love to hear Jesus' tone of voice. I'll wait for heaven for that. But Jesus doesn't even ask the man to, to exercise faith. No spiritual lectures here. He just, with his own words, he revives the little bit of faith that he sees in the man. Notice that it's the word of Jesus. It's the word of God that revives faith. And, and so Jesus addresses not only his physical need, but his spiritual need of putting his faith in God. And so the man gets up. Uh, he has to put things into action. His legs become a visual illustration of the revival that he truly needs, and that's a revival of faith. And he goes out walking, not just stepping from place to place, but this is an illustration of a life changed, of doing things actively, following the instruction of God. Is healing, is restoration possible through Jesus? It always comes through these two means that this man illustrated here, trust and obey. Mm -hmm. Trust and obey. Those two things are what God is calling us to, to do. The lesson ends by asking, what is the relationship between sickness and sin? Mm. Well, there is a relationship between sickness and sin, and we see this because Jesus illustrates it at, in verse 14 when he finds that man again later and he says, sin no more lest a worse thing come upon you. And the Desire of Ages, page 202, says that to a de great degree, this man's trouble was the cause, was caused by his own sin. Doesn't explain any further than that, but something had happened in the past. And, and this certainly fits well with what we're told by Paul in Galatians 6, 7. It says, do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, that will he also reap. So what we know is that personal sin and disobedience, there are consequences that come from that. People are suffering today because of a violation of God's laws. And God seldom works miracles, we discover, uh, to free us from the consequences of our choices because that would embolden us on, in sin and it wouldn't teach us anything about obedience. And we also understand that, that sin, a guilty conscience, it affects us physically. David writes about it in Psalm 32 and 38, and you can go look at that. But this Bible truth uh, about cause and effect had been misunderstood and misapplied. And I have to read this statement from Desire of Ages, page 471. It was generally believed by the Jews that sin is punished in this life. Every affliction, they believed, was regarded as the penalty of some wrongdoing, either that of the sufferer himself or of his parents. It is true that all suffering results from the transgression of God's law, but this truth had become perverted. Satan, the author of sin and all its results, had led men to look upon disease and death as proceeding from God as punishment arbitrarily inflicted. And this thought led the Jewish leaders ultimately to reject Jesus. Why? Because we look at Isaiah 53 that describes Jesus as a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And so verse 4 then says, we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. And so they rejected Jesus. Look, look at him. He's not anything special. God had left us an example in the book of Job, but they had not understood that. And so Jesus comes and gives a sign, not only of his power and divinity, but how he looks at the sinners, how he looks at those who are suffering. And how does Jesus look at those who are suffering? We find it in Acts 10, verse 38, where it describes that Jesus went around doing good and healing all those who were oppressed by the devil. Mm. That those sicknesses, troubles do not proceed from God, but Satan is out to get us. He is out to attack us. Luke 13, 16, Jesus heals a woman who had been bent over for years, and he describes her as a woman who had been bound by Satan. So what's the point of all of this? That regardless of the source or cause of suffering, suffering is the work of Satan. 
And what does John himself write there in 1 John 3, verse 8? That Jesus came to destroy the works of the devil. Amen. And so we can look around for the cause and try to figure out who is to blame. But Jesus comes along and he says, my goal is not necessarily to assign blame, but to bring about restoration, but to inspire in you the healing that comes from trusting and obeying. God even can use our affliction to bring us closer to him. And that's what Paul is saying in Romans 8, 28, that he says that we know that all things work together for the good of those who love God, who are called according to his purpose. Whatever the affliction may be, the goal of, uh, of Jesus, his purpose is to use that to turn our eyes toward him and he then is the restorer and then we can give glory to God as this man did. Thank you, Daniel. That was a good lesson on Shelley Quinn. I have Wednesday's lesson, Hard Hearts, and we're going to begin uh, or pick up right where Daniel left off. Here Jesus does a miracle. He has certainly healed someone who'd been in that condition for 38 years. And that's verses one through nine and believe, and then all of a sudden, by the time you get to verse 16, the Jews are persecuting Jesus. They're ready to kill him. You know, signs, wonders, and miracles don't necessarily prove that something is of God, but when there are other things that are supporting it in the Word and here, it's dangerous to ignore a miracle of God. So let's look at these Jewish leaders. They were the Pharisees, the Sadducees. The Sanhedrin was like Israel's Supreme Court, if you will. And it had the religious, civil, and criminal jurisdiction highly politicized. This was, this was a powerful group and they expected the Messiah to come as a conquering king to free them from Rome's oppression. So they were the kind of people who were so confident in their own self-righteousness, they didn't realize that they needed God's mercy. Have you ever met anybody like that? You know, when you think about um, the parable of the Pharisee and the tax collector, you see how quick they were to condemn others and exalt themselves. Jesus denounced their self-righteousness. He called them whitewashed tombs. Mm -hmm. They were, they, they loved to have that external, you know, he's talking about washing the cup on the outside. They liked that external piety and to look like this, but inside they were corrupt and hypocritical and lawless. What Jesus said to them, borrowing from last quarter, Mark 7, 13. He said that they made the word of God of no effect mm -hmm. through your tradition, which you have handed down. Be careful that you are not following tradition. Always look to the Bible because we can, by man's tradition invalidate the Word of God. The fourth commandment, God prohibited work on the Sabbath, but it was intended more for customary employment. And the rabbis in the Mishnah, they had 39 regulations that they had developed of what they forbade to do on the Sabbath. Mm. They had rigid adherence to these man-made laws. And Jesus was so distressed at their stubborn hearts. Here he was healing. This is an act of mercy on the Sabbath. And the religious leaders miss the mercy. Mm -hmm. All they know is that Jesus said, pick up your mat and, and carry it. And that was against their tradition. So John 5, 10, Jesus says, it says, the Jews therefore said to him who was cured, the man who'd been laying there 38 years, it is a Sabbath. It is not lawful for you to carry your bed. But Jesus hadn't broken God's law because there's no prohibition of doing good on the Sabbath. Listen to this comment from our quarterly. Healings were allowed on the Sabbath, according to the Jewish leaders, only in an emergency. This man had been disabled for 38 years. Thus, his healing was hardly an emergency. 
And then too, what was the necessity of having him take up his bed? One would think that someone with the power from God to perform such a miracle would also know if it were permissible to carry a mat home on the Sabbath day. Clearly, Jesus was seeking to take them to deeper biblical truths beyond their man-made rules and regulations that had, in some cases, stifled Mm -hmm. true faith. Mm -hmm. Oh, how true that is. So John 5, verse 11 through 14, Jesus answered, or or the man answered, uh, they're asking the man who was cured, who told you to pick up your bed and walk? And he answered, he said, he who made me well said to me, take up your bed and walk. Then they ask him, who is the man who said to you, take up your bed and walk? But the one who was healed did not know who it was, for Jesus had withdrawn a multitude being in that place. Afterward, Jesus found him in the temple and said to him, see, you've been made well. Sin no more, lest a worse thing come upon you. And the man departed and told the Jews that it was Jesus who had made him well. Then look at verse 16. For this reason, the Jews persecuted Jesus and sought to kill him because he had done these things on the Sabbath against their man-made traditions. Hardened hearts ignored Christ's act of mercy to this man. They were spiritually blind. I mean, they kept these, they were so close-minded and they had such hair-splitting regimens that they required for Sabbath keeping. And they were so close-minded that they completely rejected his teaching rather than going back to the scripture. They were focused on minutia and They were ignoring God's great moral principles. Mm -hmm. Listen to what Jesus said from Matthew's gospel. Matthew 23, 24. Blind guides Mm -hmm. who strain at a gnat and swallow a camel. Mm -hmm. The gnat was the smallest, considered the smallest of unclean animals. They would take their drink, put like a cheesecloth over it, and strain it out so that they wouldn't dare swallow a gnat. The camel was the largest of unclean animals. And Jesus is saying, you are so, your little uh, ideas of cleanliness have gone far beyond what God intended, but you're forgetting mercy and justice. You're swallowing a camel. And I want to say this, anytime legalism rules over compassion, we are swallowing a camel. Mm -hmm. So we've got to be careful that we're not straining at the net and doing that. So the healing of this man who was crippled 38 years during the feast, ignites their smoldering opposition that they had underneath the surface to Jesus. Now it's open hostility. They were threatened by his influence on the people. And now they persecute Jesus repeatedly. They charge him with Sabbath breaking, with blasphemy, and they sought to kill him. Other accounts in John will see how spiritually hard-hearted people can become. More evidence, the more evidence that Jesus gave of his divinity, the greater their contempt, Mm -hmm. their anger, and their hatred became. John 19, verse 16, on the Sabbath, Jesus healed a man born blind. He made clay, had him put it on his eyes, made him wash. Verse 16 of John 19, the Pharisee says, this man is not from God because he does not keep the Sabbath. John 9. John 9, did I say 19? John 9. In Mark chapter 3, 22 through 26, Jesus healed a blind and dumb demoniac and the scribes 
accused him of casting out demons by the power of Beelzebub, by the power of Satan. And Jesus said, hey, if Satan cast out Satan, his house is divided and he will fall. So this is what our authors of this lesson write. How could these religious leaders be so blind? The likely answer is that it was because of their own corrupt hearts, mm -hmm. their false belief that the Messiah would deliver them from Rome mm -hmm. right then. And, and that's a preconceived opinion that can blind us. Mm -hmm. Their love of power, that can blind us and their lack of surrender to God, that definitely can blind us. All these helped cause them to reject the truth that stood right before them. Oh, Lord, help us not to do this same. Amen, amen. amen. Yeah. Thank you, Shelley. I'm James Rafferty. I have Thursday's lesson, which is uh, entitled, Jesus Claims. And like we have been focusing on, a lot of this lesson, this introductory lesson, is really focusing on the claims of Christ to be who He was, which was Messiah and Son of God. When we look at uh, each one of the lessons, like persisting against all odds and looking for the fruits and seeing the face of Jesus and just recognizing the hypocrisy of the religious leaders, Jesus came to do away with all of that, not just by His words, but by who He was. Amen. He came to reveal to us the revelation of God Himself, and He did this in His person. And so the lesson starts out by focusing on Christ's claims. Uh, in this lesson, we're st still in John chapter 5, and the quarterly says that the miracle of the pool of Bethesda provided an excellent opportunity for John to emphasize who Jesus is. John takes about 14 verses to describe the miracle and about 33 verses <laughs> to describe the one who performed the miracle. So his focus here is really establishing Christ through the miracles. And as Ryan said so well, it's not just the miracles, but it's the person behind the miracles that needs to be investigated. And John does that. He lets us investigate Jesus, if you will, see if he's got the fruits, to see if he's revealing the real character of God. So the quarterly begins uh, uh, for Thursday saying, in John chapter 5, 16 to 18, and therefore did the Jews persecute Jesus and sought to slay him because he had done these things on the Sabbath day. That's why Jesus was persecuted. He'd done these things on the Sabbath day. But Jesus answered them and said, my father works hitherto and I work. Therefore the Jews sought the more to kill him because he had not only broken the Sabbath, but said also that God was his father making himself equal with God. So here's two violations right away. And Jesus knows what's coming. He's ready for it. Right? He's engaging in the conflict. And as was said earlier, and I just thought this is really interesting, the book of John highlights that Christ spent most of his ministry at Jerusalem. Now, Jerusalem was where his enemies were, right? He didn't shy away from the battle. Not that he was there the whole time, but John really wants to emphasize because Jesus came to do what he came to do, he had to put himself in a position that was going to uh, uh, unmask the hypocrisy of the religious leaders and he had to kind of confront them. He was the one to do it because the only person who could do it was the one who was actually living the principles of God's law because he would be accused of being Beelzebub, uh, of being an imposter, of being a hypocrite. And of course, only Christ could uh, oppose those false claims by his life. He lived this perfect life. So in John 5, 18, the quarterly goes on to say, um, we can see a disturbing argument because some will use this to say that Jesus actually broke the Sabbath. And I've heard people say that, you know, well, you guys believe that you should keep the seventh day Sabbath, but Jesus himself didn't keep the seventh day Sabbath. The Bible says so because the Pharisees, the hypocrites, the people who weren't actually living the truth said he didn't keep the Sabbath. Well, you can believe them or you can believe Jesus. I think it's important for us to believe what Jesus says about his Sabbath keeping. For example, in John chapter 15 and verse 10, Jesus says, If you keep my commandments, you shall abide in my love, even as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in His love. So who are you going to believe? Are you going to believe what Jesus says about His commandment keeping? Or are you going to believe what the Pharisees said who called Jesus Beelzebub, who basically said He was casting out devils by the prince of the devils? 
I'm going to believe Jesus Christ. If he says he kept the Sabbath, then I'm going to conclude that the Sabbath breaking that the Jews accused him of was none other than what Shelley said, straining at a gnat while they were swallowing a camel. So Jesus worked on the Sabbath because he was in relationship with the Father who also does not stop working on the Sabbath. He keeps the universe going and flowing. So Jesus' Sabbath activity is really part of his claim to divinity, if you will. It's a proof that he is divine, not that he's a Sabbath breaker. And the religious leaders persecuted him on the basis of his supposed Sabbath breaking and his claim to be equal with God. Jesus says also in John chapter 8, verse 46, which of you convicts me of sin? If I tell you the truth, why do you not believe me? And that was the issue. The issue was the truth. They were trying to put some dirt on Jesus because they didn't want to get to the nitty gritty of the truth, the reality of the revelation of truth in Jesus Christ. So the Pharisees and the, the Sadducees were trying to convict Jesus of failing to wash his hands before he ate. And of course, you better believe that if he's failing to wash his hands before he ate, they're really gonna go after him if he's breaking the fourth commandment. And Jesus Christ shows that he, indeed he is not breaking or violating the fourth commandment or any of God's commandments by simply recognizing or, or stating that he has kept all of his commandments. In fact, he says in John verses, uh, chapter 14, verse 30, hereafter I will not talk much with you for the prince of this world comes and he has nothing in me. So there was nothing in Christ that Satan could actually uh, use to say that he had violated God's law, that he had uh, failed to be our perfect sacrifice. In 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 18 and 19, Peter affirms this. He affirms the sinlessness of Christ when he says, for as much as you know that you are not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as a lamb without blemish and without spot, he had to be perfect. Jesus had to be perfect because we needed his perfect, perfect righteousness to be saved from our sins. We need that perfect righteousness to stand in our place. And because of the faultless character of Christ, he is able to present us faultless before the throne of glory. That's what it says in Jude 1 24. Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling, to falling and present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. We are faultless because of Jesus Christ. You want a, a little bit more study on that, you can get Shelley's uh, new book, Spotless. So here we see the real issue. Satan is trying to undermine the ministry of Christ because Jesus Christ has come to save us from our sins. He's trying to put some kind of dirt on Jesus Christ, something, some way of making uh, us believe and the people believe that he is actually a sinner. And we know this isn't true. We know that Jesus Christ accomplished his mission. Mission accomplished for us. In Romans chapter 5, verse 10, uh, we're told that if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. His death and his life are our salvation. And saved from what? You know, Paul actually continues the same argument by saying in Romans chapter 8 and verse 1, there is now therefore no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. We're saved from condemnation. And condemnation is a big thing to be saved from because condemnation keeps this cycle of guilt and sin going in our lives. And when Jesus lifts the con uh, condemnation, when he lifts the guilt, the cycle is broken and we become free. We become free to live the life in the spirit that God wanted us to live, producing the fruits of the spirit, which Jesus exemplified in his life again and again. So the quarterly goes on to say that Jesus defended his action in three steps in John chapter five. First, he explains his intimate relationship with the father. And that's in John 5, 19 through 30. Jesus indicates that he and his father act in harmony to the point that Jesus has the power both to judge and raise the dead, John 5, 25 to 30. Second, Jesus calls four witnesses in rapid succession in his defense. John the Baptist, John 5, 31 to 35. The miracles that Jesus does, John 5, verse 36. The Father, John 5, 37 and 38. And the scriptures, John 5, 39. Four witnesses. Each of these witnesses give testimony in favor 
of Jesus. And finally, in John 5, 40 to 47, Jesus sets before his accusers their own condemnation, revealing the contrast between his ministry and their self-seeking. Right? Their condemnation, he says, will come from Moses, according to John 5, 45 to 47, the one in whom they have set their hopes. So clearly we see here in John chapter 5, Jesus establishing his authority before the people and before the religious leaders. And of course, this is paramount to the Gospel of John. John introduces Jesus as the Word, and we're going to talk about that in a, in a future study, but John introduces him as the Word of God, as one who is one with God, and John chapter 5 settles this, seals this up, and not just in some private uh, wilderness area or some small wedding feast, but right there in Jerusalem before the leaders, the religious leaders, John settles this before all of the people and the religious leaders so that we today can have our hope set on Jesus Christ. Amen. Yeah. Thank you so much, true. Pastor James. What a great study, each one of you. Want to give you a moment to share a closing thought? Ryan, start with you. Amen. Yeah, you know, I just want to re read this text from John chapter 20 and verse 29, which goes along with my lesson. Uh, it says, Jesus said to Thomas, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Let us root and ground our belief in the person of Jesus Christ. And of course, those miracles are just an added extra bonus. That's right. You know, in, in John 5, Jesus healed just one, but the promise and the power of restoration is made available to each one, including you, and it starts with seeing the face of Jesus. Amen. Amen and amen. Wednesday's lesson was about hard hearts. What made the people's hearts hard? They had preconceived opinions mm -hmm. that didn't line up with true prophecy in scripture. They had traditions of men that contradicted mm -hmm. God's word. It invalidated God's word. They had a love of power. They weren't surrendered to God. And we see in John 8, 42, Jesus, well, let me begin with verse 40. Jesus says to these same men, you're not willing to come to me that you may have life in verse 42, but I know you that you don't have the love of God in you. That's what causes hard hearts. You know, the witnesses that Jesus calls are the same witnesses that we need to call, the power of God to raise mm -hmm. from the dead into newness of life. The witness of people, uh, friends and brothers and sisters in Christ, uh, the witness uh, of God in our lives and His testimony toward us. And we need to be careful not to fall into the same trap of believing in God and believing in doctrines and not surrendering our hearts fully to the witnesses that God has given in Christ's life and in our life. Amen. Pastor James and Shelley and Daniel and Ryan, thank you for your study of the Word of God. It's going to be an exciting excursion as we walk through the Gospel of John. You might have noticed we didn't start in John chapter 1. That's because the author of this lesson does not do it chronologically. Chronologically, instead, it is thematically. So we studied the first signs. Next week, lesson two is signs of divinity. We complete that cycle of seven with those signs. And then the third lesson, we jump into John chapter one. So join us next week, 3 and Sabbath School panel.